Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh Church. And this series is on the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. This is not lesson number four in that series entitled Facing Opposition. And we're going to find out that there's quite a lot of opposition in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. This is the lesson for October 26 of 2019. And as usual, we would like to start with a word of prayer. A kind and wonderful Father. We wish we could have been standing beside your throne as you observed all these events in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. What did the angels think? What did you think? What did those four living creatures think as they observed what was happening there? But we were encouraged to find out that Nehemiah was wise with your wisdom in dealing with the opposition and May we have the same courage is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We are going to discuss in this lesson two major building projects about 70 years apart. The first building project was building the temple. The first thing, when they arrived back from, and some of them from Babylon and some of them all the way from over in Persia somewhere, when they arrived back at Jerusalem, Nehemiah had made sure that when he finished up with, with Jerusalem the last time, it was nothing but a pile of rubble. How would not, you like... Not Nehemiah, but... Uh, I'm sorry, Ezra. No, Zerubbabel. Yeah, Thank you. No, no, you're talking yeah. about the person that, that conquered it, Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, I'm sorry. Nebuchadnezzar, that's correct. Thank you. Nebuchadnezzar left it. He left nothing but a pile of rubble. And when Zerubbabel came with his group back, that's what they faced. And what do you think when you think you're coming home to a capital city and you're going to move in and there's a pile of rubble. Just the broom and the... Just the broom and yeah, exactly. Well, so we're going to find out about that and the problems they had and so forth. And then seven years later, we're going to talk about the days of Ezra and Nehemiah and the challenge of building the city wall around the city of Jerusalem. So... The first re- group of returnees under Governor Zerubbabel and the high priest, Joshua, started rebuilding that temple in about 537 or 536 B.C., following the permission they had been given by the emperor, and immediately they ran into roadblocks. Between 537 and 535, they started rebuilding. They managed to get the Temple Mount cleared off. They established an altar where they could actually, a foundation under that altar that they could actually worship at. But then by 535, the opposition was so fierce that they just gave up and stopped building. So now they have an altar, but no temple, no foundation, no plan really. Fifteen years went by. Another king is, uh, comes in place of now Cyrus is dead, his son Cambyses is dead, and now um, I think it was Darius or Darius was the one who gave them permission to get started again. And they they got started and they got started really under the leadership of Haggai and Zechariah. And if we had time, we would go and look at those two books. Those two prophets were one of them, two of the most successful prophets in the entire Bible. They came out, they inspired the people, the people got to work. They, I mean, it's, it's like Nehemiah later. I don't, I don't know how these guys did it, but they really inspired the group and they got it done. So in 515 B.C., the temple construction was completed. They now have a temple and an altar in front of the temple and walls around the temple, but... No walls around the city. The most, much of the rest of the city is still nothing but rubble. Fifty years passed. During that time, the Jews were threatened with annihilation because of what happened during the days of Esther and Mordecai. I'm sure that you, if you're familiar with the Bible, know about that story. All, all the Jews in the whole empire were supposed to be eliminated, and uh, you know what happened. Finally, in 465 B.C., the children of Israel began to attempt to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. And that lasted for about a year. There was opposition, terrible opposition to rebuilding the Jerusalem. That's described in Ezra 4, verses 7 through 23. Artaxerxes was encouraged to write a letter, which he did, stopping the work. 
in his early years. So he wrote a letter, says, stop building that. Remember what kind of letter did they send? Letter saying these guys are a bunch of rebels. If you let them build this city, they're going to be nothing but trouble for you, etc., etc. Well, then in 457... Ezra working with mission from King Artaxerxes. Now, he had gotten personally permission from King Artaxerxes again, returned to Jerusalem with a small group, relative, well, a small group, uh, somewhere around seven, ten thousand, 10,000, somewhere like that, um, and restarted the building of the wall. They hardly got started, and it was terrible opposition. So, uh, Dennis, I think you have that next piece summarized for us. Right, and this is from the Adult uh, Teachers Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 53. Uh, 457 B.C., Ezra arrives in Jerusalem, Ezra 7, while work is stopped. Ezra 3 mentions the rebuilding of the temple's altar and the foundations, which took place in 537 to 535 B.C. as a result of Cyrus's edict in Ezra 1. After an initial celebration in Ezra 3, the work was abandoned, Ezra 4, because of strong opposition, which began around 535 B.C. and lasted until 520 B.C. Uh, see Ezra 4 to 6. Ezra 4 6 uh, briefly describes the opposition to building under Xerxes, uh, 486 to 465 B.C. Then in Ezra 4, 7 to 23, we read the opposition during the early reign of King Artaxerxes. Ezra includes copies of the letters that were sent to both kings Artaxerxes and Darius. The letters are inserted in Aramaic while the rest of the book is written in Hebrew, which means that these were official documents preserved in the language that was used for public documents at that time. Aramaic was the universal language at that time, just as English is today. In 520 B.C., after 15 years of vigorous opposition, the prophet Haggai uh, stirred up the people to continue building the temple. Read his five short, powerful sermons in the book of Haggai. The prophet... Zechariah. Zechariah. I'm sorry. Zechariah. I got the wrong... Anyway, the prophet Zechariah joined in support, resulting in the completion of the temple in less than five years and its dedication in March of uh, 515 B.C. in Ezra 6, followed by the celebration of the Passover one month later, Ezra 6, 19-22. Okay, now, I hope you all have your thinking caps on because I'm going to give you a little quiz. Which books of the Old Testament... Have, are written in more than one language originally. Daniel. And Daniel was. Ezra. Ezra was. Esther. Esther was. Why were those three written with in more than one language? Because Aramaic was the official language. Well, that's, yeah, yeah they that's. They were part of the government. Yeah, they were, they were involved with government proceedings, and so that was the language of the government. So when there was something that involved the government, they just assumed that people reading their their materials would be able to read both languages and so they would jump back and forth. About half of Daniel is in Aramaic. Probably a quarter of Esther maybe is in Aramaic and a third of something, I, I should, didn't calculate the exact amounts, about a third of Ezra is in Aramaic and it is the, it's the government decrees. So that's, and it's important for us to note that while Hebrew was used by Ezra and perhaps by Nehemiah in their writing, the language of the Jews from the time of the Babylonian captivity until the days of Jesus was Aramaic. Aramaic, not Hebrew. Aramaic was a native language, the mother tongue of Jesus. Now, why was that? You know why that happened? Anybody? When they moved to Babylon in the Babylonian captivity, they were forced to use the language of the ruling family, Nebuchadnezzar's family. And that included two major, two very important things. One, they had to speak Aramaic instead of Hebrew. Now, Hebrew and Aramaic are fairly closely related, kind of like Spanish and Portuguese, so they were sort of close together. But not only that, they also had to change their alphabet at that same time. 
So today you see Hebrew written in that ba- those very square letters, and even modern Hebrew is written in those very square letters. If you go to ancient Hebrew before the days of the Babylonian captivity, it's written in very strange, completely different kind of... I mean, you can recognize that there's some relationship, but it's a very different alphabet. Hmm. So the alphabet changed and the language changed when they moved, when they were taken into Babylonian captivity. That's an important thing to remember about the history of the Jewish people. Well, it should be clear from these paragraphs that Ezra 3 through 6 is not organized chronologically. In fact, the name of Ezra is not mentioned until Ezra 7 verse 1. You know, a lot of other prophetic books start Isaiah or Zechariah or Amos. Amos is the prophet, da, da, da. But Ezra's name is not mentioned until chapter 7 where his genealogy starts. The Jews were surrounded by enemies who had determined to prevent them from redeveloping a correct worship in the temple and later were determined to prevent them from building the wall around the city. Now, why do you suppose that was? Anybody? Any idea? Because of Satan's opposition to the lineage that was going to produce the Savior. Very well said. That's a good, great controversy explanation, but... The local people, they didn't know anything about the great controversy. What was their explanation? They hated the Jews. They hated the Jews. Not only that, what else? Think about it. If you've got a whole country that has had all the people gone, what are other people going to do? They're They're going to move in. They're going to pick out the best spots and so forth like this. So if the Jews come back and try to reclaim their country, what's going to happen to you people who settled in? Sort of what happened now. Yes, yes, yes. Opposition that we just read about is from not. It's from the people that moved in from outside. Yeah. Yes. No, after the fall of the northern ten tribes. But now remember Which that. Like seven hundred something. Yeah. the The northern kingdom is well. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But the northern kingdom was populated after the kingdom of Israel fell to the Assyrians. Assyrians, not Syrians, but Assyrians, and with a capital in Nineveh. They scattered the people from the northern kingdom all through their property, their territory. Their idea was if you scatter people out like that, they won't be able to have a concentration anywhere enough to start a rebellion. That was the basic idea of the Assyrians. They're coming back to build up this. So when that happened, when that happened, the Assyrians took people from a bunch of different places and said, we're moving you from where your home was and we're making you the new inhabitants of the northern kingdom of Israel. Nothing new that happened in Second World War II. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Same story. So when they got there, there was some strange and interesting things happened. In those old days, they believed that the world was divided not only between different peoples and different languages, but they believed that a a different God was assigned to each territory. So the people who got settled in the northern kingdom of Israel, what used to be the northern kingdom of Israel, sent message back to Nineveh and said, hey, you you got to send us a, a priest from this area can teach us how to worship the God of this area. So they found some priests from that area and sent them back. Now, given what you know about the fall of Israel and what their condition was in the days of Hosea and Amos and so forth like this, what kind of priests do you think those were? Probably priests of Baal and Ashtar. Yeah. Pagan priests, well, at least at least priests who were mixing up the worship of Jehovah with or Yahweh with pagan customs, very much so. So these people who had been brought in by the Assyrians now have what? A contaminated religion. So we're going to see what happens next. Mm. Jackie? So this is from Ezra 4. The enemies of the people of Judah and Benjamin heard that those who had returned from exile were rebuilding the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel. So they went to see Zerubbabel and the heads of the clans and said, Let us join you in building the temple. We worship the same God you worship, and we have been offering sacrifices to him ever since... Esther Haddon. There you go. Emperor of Assyria sent us here to live. Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the heads of the clan said to them, We don't need your help to build a temple for the Lord our God. We will build it ourselves, just as Cyrus, emperor of Persia, commanded us. 
Then the people who had been living in the land tried to discourage and frighten the Jews and keep them from building. They also bribed Persian government officials to work against them. They kept on doing this throughout the reign of Cyrus and into the reign of Darius. Okay, very good. So now you get a little better idea what the background was behind that opposition. If you really want, and for you out there, we don't have time to do it on our program today, but if you want to get a real idea of what the background is behind this, you need to read 2 Kings 17, verses 5 to 41. Just incredible things. They were sacrificing their children. They were worshiping everything under the sun. They were... Uh, worshiping the sun, the moon, the stars. They were, uh, it, 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 they were, uh, you just, it goes on. You can't believe the condition of the people of Israel before they were finally overthrown. Um, they had rebelled against God continuously from the, since the days of Jeroboam. And what, ha- where did Jeroboam come in? Do you remember? Well, he, he rebelled uh, against Rehoboam. Yeah. He, oh. he rebelled. He so, didn't appreciate Rehoboam. Solomon basically led to that rebellion, that split in the country because of high taxes and lots of wives. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a long story, but basically that's, that's a brief, very brief part, part of it. So from the time Jeroboam rebelled against Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, the history of Israel was filled with pagan inroads and opposition from surrounding nations. The last thing that the Jews needed was to have their temple in Jerusalem be used for pagan ceremonies or pagan worship alongside the worship of Yahweh. And I unfortunately will tell you that it wouldn't, wasn't very long before that happened even anyway. Again, yeah. It is clear from Ezra 4, 4 to 5 that these people were not sincerely wanting to assist in the worship of the true God. They were known as adversaries or enemies from the beginning. Later they did everything they could to stop or slow the work. And Paul in the New Testament had some words to say about people who get together with enemies. Do you remember what it says? Do not try to work together as equals with unbelievers, for it cannot be done. How can right and wrong be partners? How can light and darkness live together? So it's pretty clear how he felt about that. Um, Could that have something to do with us today? I mean, not only in terms of marriage, which is what we often we often apply it to, but in lots of other ways. I know of people whose businesses have gone whoosh, because an Adventist group or Adventist person uh, joined with somebody else, thought this would help to build their business, and pretty soon the business has gone all sorts of crazy directions. Um, yeah, there might be some exceptions, like in a disaster where the yeah. Red Cross and ADRA sure. joined forces and others. And But uh, you wonder about uh, then our institutions that have to hire people from... Uh, or that combine with another official church. Yes, exactly. Walla Walla, Washington. So. Yes. Yeah, and you, and in a case like that, you wonder... Would we, be, would we be better off just to close the place down as opposed to joining with somebody else because we have, that's the way what we have to seem to have to do to survive financially? Those are tough questions. Those are really tough questions. A lot of dedication and prayer. Yeah. There are a lot of, quote, Adventist hospitals, end quote, that have zero, one, or two Adventist physicians and uh, so on in them. And as you say, is it better to close it or to try and influence people as it is? That's that's the challenge. My uh, friend of mine was teaching le- the lesson last week and he, he grew up in uh, communist Yugoslavia. Oh boy. He's, uh, he teaches biochemistry here and he said that all through his Secular education, uh, he would talk to people about evolution, and they, there was no issue. But he has not found as much anger and opposition as when he came here mm-hmm. to Lomlinda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's uh, 
Well, we won't go anyway, there. No. I, anyway, the, it would... I have a brother in high places, as you know, and the kinds of problems that uh, he, he has to deal with is pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we come next to Ezra 5, verses 1 to 5. But at that time, two prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, we've already talked about them a little bit, <clears throat> began to speak in the name of God of Israel to the Jews who lived in Judah and Jerusalem. By the way, there's an interesting little bit of trivia here that's important for us to understand. Who was Zechariah's father? I don't know. Berechiah was his father. So why does it call him the son of Ido? It's wrong. What does Ido mean? <laughs> what does Ido mean? Maybe that was the last name. No. Ido Berakai. Huh? What, what does Ido mean, though? Ido is a man's name. Okay. Well, sometimes people will, yeah. you know, like when Jesus was rebuking mm-hmm. the, uh, the Pharisees or yeah. Sadducees, uh, you know, to call them the son of the devil. Yeah. No, uh, that's not what's involved here. We don't know absolutely for sure, but we have a pretty good idea. These people were the priests down the line, coming down the line, working. And Ido was the priest apparently for quite a period of time. We don't know whether his son, Berechiah, died before he did or died very soon after he did so that the next person who took over was Zechariah. So even though Zechariah is his grandson, you read, go look in the book of Zechariah and you'll mm-hmm. see that he's the grandson. He's called the son here because people recognize that he's basically the next person in line in the priesthood. And this is an example of the fact that often in the, in the Bible, you look, at the, you look at the genealogy of Jesus in the New Testament. There are a number of uh, names that are left out in that genealogy, be, genealogy because people thought, okay, those are people aren't particularly important or whatever reason, so that if someone says, well, his father was, it might really be his grandfather, even his great-grandfather in mm-hmm. some cases. So this is the way they, <clears throat> they dealt with things like that, and uh, it didn't bother them too much. So and we're all children of Abraham. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're all children of Abraham. But when Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Jehozadak, heard these mes- their messages, they began to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, and the, true prof- the two prophets helped them. Almost at once, Tatnai, governor of West Euphrates, Sheth- Shethar Bozani, and their fellow officials came to Jerusalem and demanded, Who gave you orders to build this temple and equip it? They also asked for the names of all the men who were hoping to build the temple. But God was watching over the Jewish leaders, and the Persian officials decided to take no action until they could write to Darius or Darius and receive a ply. This is the report that they had sent, and so forth and so forth. We're not going to read the details, but they had permission, and they continued. Imagine returning from Babylon to Persia and so forth. We've talked about to nothing but r- rubble and fierce opposition. Fortunately, those two prophets arose. It's clear that the people had managed to find materials for building their own houses. Uh, we should look at that. Look at Haggai chapter 1. During the second year that Darius was emperor of Persia, on the first day of the sixth month, the Lord spoke to the prophet Haggai. The message was for the governor of Judah, Zerubbabel son of Shealtiel, and for the high priest Joshua son of Jehozadak. The Lord Almighty said to Haggai, These people say that this is not the right time to rebuild the temple. The Lord then gave them this message, and I'm going to drop down. It says, you know, why why are you eating comfortably and building nice houses and so forth? And why aren't you rebuilding the temple? And, of course, the the result was they inspired people. Uh, It is clear that the people had managed to find materials for building their own houses and making them very nice, but somehow they chose to ignore the rebuilding of the temple of God. Margaret? Hey, the prophet Haggai and Zechariah were raised up to meet the crisis, stirring testimonies. These Meet the crisis. In stirring testimonies, these appointed messengers revealed to the people the cause of their troubles. The lack of temporal prosperity was the result of a neglect to put God's interests first. The prophets declared, Had the Israelites honored God? Had they shown him due respect and courtesy by making the building of his house their first work? They would have invited his presence and his blessings. As Ellen G. White, Prophets and Kings. Very good. Well, it turns out that some of these people, one of the complaints that Haggai brings up is, 
You're living in houses with cedar ceilings in them. Where did they get the cedar from? Lebanon. Lebanon. And which private individual from Jerusalem would have money and means for bringing cedar from Lebanon? None. This cedar had been brought from Lebanon for the building of the temple. And since it wasn't being used in the building of the temple, people said, well... We'll Let me make a nice ceiling for my house. So that helps you to get a little more of the picture. Many years later, during the reign of Artaxerxes, the emperor of Medo-Persia, the people living in Judah began to work on the wall. I mean, you would think, okay, we're gradually building houses up here. We're getting the rubble cleared away. What do we need? We need a wall, right? But their enemies managed to write a letter to Emperor Artaxerxes and get the wall stopped again. Clearly, their enemies were doing everything they could to prevent the Jews from reestablishing themselves in their territory. It's interesting to note that King Artaxerxes was initially convinced to write a letter forbidding the Jews to rebuild. Later, under Ezra and Nehemiah, that same emperor gave them permission that finally allowed them to succeed in rebuilding the wall. What do you suppose convinced Artaxerxes to change his mind? Three-letter word, God. Yeah. Okay, that's a possibility. In fact, I'm sure that's a major factor. But how did he actually, he didn't sort of appear in person and try to convince him. What did he do? He worked through Ezra, and later he worked through Nehemiah. And they were people he trusted. And these were people he trusted. He had gotten Before he had gotten a letter with something he didn't very much know much about, and this letter said, you know, this is going to be a problem and so forth. But now he has people that he knows and trusts, and they have told him it's not like what you thought, it's like this. These people are just trying to rebuild their homes. And he said, oh yeah, I'll send you over there and you can be in charge and I can trust you. I know I can trust you. So he changed his mind. By the way, was that a good thing if you're a emperor of Medo-Persia? It's good to have friends in other places. <laughs> it's good to have friends in high places. Especially high places. Yeah. You remember what happened with uh, with Esther and the laws of the Medes and Persians? Oh yeah, they are not supposed to be changed. They're not supposed to be changed. But he managed to change it, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He changed the outcome because he added another law that countered that one. So there was one vector in place that Mm -hmm. went this way and another vector that came back to oppose it. As in the days of Esther. Yeah. Then as today, under opposition like what we have seen so far in the rebuilding of the temple and the wall, it would have been very easy to have just given up. All kinds of excuses could have been given. How many times have Adventists, Seventh-day Adventists, started out to do certain projects and run into opposition? Has that ever happened to us personally? Hmm. Well, 13 years after Ezra arrived back in Judah and had tried to get the building of the wall going again, Nehemiah arrived and began to take action. And uh, we should probably read a few of those verses anyway. Look at Nehemiah 2. Then this is a story about Nehemiah's interaction with the, with the emperor. Then I asked him to grant me the favor of giving me letters to the governors of West Euphrates province, and that's where Judah was located, instructing them to let me travel to Judah, one, I asked also for a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal forest. By the way, do we remember? Do you remember something we said about Asaph? Well, he is all over the Psalms. He wrote quite a few of okay, the Psalms. Okay, this is a different, different Asaph. Asaph. This is a, this one's five hundred years later. Yeah. Okay, but that gives us a hint because Asaph is a Hebrew name. Yeah. So this man who was in charge of the keeper of the royal forest may have been a Jew. It's possible also that he was from another nation, but he just chose a Jewish name, but it's possible he was a Jew. And he was instructed to give them the timbers and things they needed to accomplish what was needed to be done. So the the emperor sent some army officials and a troop of horsemen with me, and I made the journey to West Euphrates. And we'll go back over here to learn about what happened. Nehemiah was fully convinced that his success in getting permission from the emperor and arriving safely in Jerusalem was a sufficient reason to believe that God was behind the rebuilding project. Do you think you would be convinced of that just as he was? I I think so. I think I would be. 
but he did not leave anything to chance. After he'd been in the city only three days, what did he do? A secret tour of the city. <coughs> okay. So the wall in those days was about three miles around. And he was out there with two or three trusted friends, made their way around the wall. So when he came back, having done that, and he spoke about the wall, he knew what he was talking about. Right? Then he stood up before the Jewish people and spelled out what he thought should be done. The fact that he had done his homework and could speak with accuracy about what needed to be done inspired the people. They responded saying, let's rebuild. Of course, they had tried it already several times. Of course, as you might guess, their enemies arrived almost immediately and started making started by making fun of them. Look at Nehemiah 4, 1 to 3. Actually, Jackie already... No, I'm sorry, you didn't. You read Ezra. Nehemiah 4, 1 to 3 says, When Sanballat heard that we Jews had begun rebuilding the wall, he was furious and began to ridicule us. In front of his companions and the Samaritan troops, he said, What do these miserable Jews think they're doing? Do they intend to rebuild the city? Do they think that by offering sacrifices they can finish the work in one day? And they make building stones out of heaps of burnt rubble? rubble? Tobiah was standing there beside him, and he added, What kind of a wall could they ever build? Even a fox could knock it down. So that's a very nice way to speak about the work that people are trying to do, right? This, of course, made their enemies very angry. They plotted to attack the Jews and destroy them. But repeatedly, Jews living among those enemies warned the Jews in advance of their enemies' plans, and they, pre- to, and they prevented disaster. So now let's get a mental picture of what's going on here. Jerusalem is a city that's being rebuilt. It's still got a lot of rubble around it and so forth. They're trying to figure out what to do with the rubble and build the city wall up. But where do most of the people live? Outside of Jerusalem. And who else is living out there? Their enemies. So when these enemies start planning to do something, they get word of it and they said they send a message saying, Be- beware, this is what's coming. This is what's going to happen. It's called spies. Well, yeah. It just call, it, 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 just, it calls keeping your ears open if you live among the enemy. Spies, if you like. Eventually it became necessary for the people building the wall to arm themselves with swords, spears, bows, and armor. Sometimes one person had to hold the weapons while another person worked. Imagine, I, they probably traded off, I'm assuming. You work for a while, I'll hold the weapons. When you get tired, you can hold the weapons and I'll work. Nehemiah even developed an alarm system. How did the alarm system work? Ram horns. The ram's horn. Yeah, they had these, you've probably seen these curly horns like this, and they would blow in one end and it was open. You can still buy one of those if you go to Bethlehem. Um, you know, those ram's horn things, and they can make quite a noise. And so he had, and, and the priests used them for calling people to worship and so forth like this. So he, now he's stationing, stationing these priests with their rams running around the city. So he says, if you, hear, if you see something coming, the enemy attacking from your direction, blow that horn, blow that trumpet, and we'll come rushing over there and see what's going on, help to back you up. So it worked. A number of the people working on the wall did not live inside the city. They came from surrounding villages. Nehemiah recognized that this placed them at significant danger. So he told them that they must remain in Jerusalem until the wall was finished. So now I want you to think about this for a moment. Here you are, you're living out there, and you're surrounded, or at least partially surrounded, by people from Samaria and so forth like this. And every day you get up early in the morning and trudge off to Jerusalem to help build the wall, and the Samaritan people are saying, What are these people doing? If they rebuild that wall, we might get chased out of here. So, he said, what did, he, what did Nehemiah tell them? You need to stay inside the city until, well, the, until wall the wall gets finished. built. Because you're going back and forth. Pretty soon they're going to figure out who's helping out with the wall and they're going to, they're going to be wanting to kill you. So he did something else that was quite remarkable. He personally stated that he did not take off his clothes even at night, neither did any of his companions nor his servants nor his bodyguard. They all kept weapons handy. Nehemiah 24, 22, and 23. So they, why were they doing that? 
Well, they'd be ready to fight. Exactly. They didn't want. It. They didn't have time to stand stand up and get ready and put on their armor and grab their weapons. They want to be ready. If somebody attacked, they want to be. And I can tell you, uh, from Ellen White's writings and so forth, that multiple times, even before this, they had tried to put up wooden gates and so forth like this, and the enemies just came and burned them down. So they were all prepared to do that kind of stuff. It's hard to sleep in a uh, with a sword on your side, I think. Well, probably not poking at you in the side. Probably <laughs> a little ways away. <laughs> Yeah. But they were ready. As yeah, they were ready. Mm -hmm. As soon as they woke up, they could be on their feet defending. So, Nehemiah, I'm sure, was traveling around that wall, speaking to people and said, God is with us. We can do this. So his faith, which in turn was supported by Ezra's faith, I'm sure, inspired the people to believe that God was behind the project. But they did not just sit back and wait for God to solve their problems for them. And to talk about Ezra and Nehemiah working together, if you follow along, you're going to find out the time the time is going to come. That wall was big enough so they could actually march a troop around on the top of the wall, and they marched around in opposite directions and meet, met on the other side as a celebration. So that's this is not just a thin little wall. It is important to realize that almost the entire population of Jews in and around Jerusalem willingly engaged in this work. What happens when you get a whole population of people all together determined to do something? They get things done. They get things done. What would happen if most of the members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church would take seriously the task of finishing the gospel in our day? Could we get things done? Possibly, yeah. Possibly yeah, not too sure. <laughs> well, I think it takes a while to get it going. But uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, no argument. The idea of every member involvement. Yeah, yep. Okay, well, Nehemiah had some words for the people. They're found in Nehemiah 4, 13 and 14 and 19 and 21. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, great and awesome, and fight for your brothers your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. Our God will fight for us. If you were certain that that, that described your condition, would you have been inspired to work on the wall even at the risk of your life? Uh, I mean, we live so comfortably and we don't have enemies attacking us and we don't need to get excited and do anything, do we? The day is coming when that's going to change. The day is coming when that's going to change. You better believe that. The Jews living there needed a Nehemiah or an Ezra to mm -hmm. inspire them to... Do we need a, ne a Nehemiah or an Ezra? Possibly. We might. I think maybe we ought to all have the theme or mantra, our God will fight for us. Yeah. That's what we should say every morning when we get up. And I have tried to say on a few occasions that... Uh, you know, you might think this is a terrible battle. How can I possibly do it? And then you say, well, if it's God in me, you think we have enough <laughs> energy How can and you force? lose? Yeah. How can you lose? Yeah. I read this last quarter, um, but it might be a good time to repeat it again. This is from Prophets, Prophets and Kings 638, paragraph 3. Nehemiah's whole soul was in the enterprise he had undertaken. His hope, his energy, his enthusiasm, his determination were contagious, inspiring others with the same high courage and lofty purpose. Each man became a Nehemiah in his turn and helped to make stronger the heart and hand of his neighbor. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, unfortunately, the Jews had been stopped many times from building. But this time they could not be stopped. They were certain that God had called them to rebuild the wall. What criteria would you use in determining if what you were doing is God's will? What if you're directly following the advice in Scripture? Would you be sure that you were doing God's will? This is what uh, Ellen White says in fifth volume of the test, fifth volume of the Testimonies, five twelve. There are three ways in which the Lord reveals his will to us, to guide us and to fit us to guide others. How may, may, may we know his voice from that of a stranger? How shall we distinguish it from the voice of a false shepherd? 
God reveals his will to us in his word, the Holy Scriptures. His voice is also revealed in his providential workings, and it will be recognized if we do not separate our souls from him by walking in our own ways, doing according to our own wills, and following the promptings of an unsanctified heart until the senses have become so confused that eternal things are not discerned and the voice of Satan is so disguised that it is accepted as the voice of God. Another way in which God's voice is heard is through the appeals of his Holy Spirit, making impressions upon the heart which will be wrought out in the character. If you are in doubt upon any subject, you must first consult the scriptures. If you have truly begun the life of faith, you have given yourself to the Lord to be wholly his, and he has taken you to mold and fashion according to his purpose, that you may be a vessel unto honor. You should have an earnest desire to be pliable in his hands and to follow whithersoever he may lead you. You are then trusting him to work out his designs, which are at the same time, which at the same time you are cooperating with him by working out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You, my brother, will have difficulty here because you have not learned by experience to know the voice of the Good Shepherd, and this places you in doubt and peril. You ought to be able to distinguish his voice. Very good. Wow. Well, as completion of the wall drew near, the enemies of the Jews became desperate. Sanballat. Tobiah, Geshem, and others of their enemies decided that they should try to call Nehemiah down to the plain of Ono to discuss issues. What do we know about the plain of Ono? Anybody? It was in the heart of enemy territory. Fortunately, Nehemiah recognized immediately that it was going to be an attempt to kill him. Four times they repeated this message. Each time he sent the same reply. I am doing important work and cannot go down there. I am not going to let the work stop just to go and see you. I'm busy. (laughs) I'm busy. I I love that response. Finally, Sanballat sent an open letter to try to force Nehemiah to come and meet. Uh, That's in Nehemiah 6, 6 6-8. It read, Geshem tells me that a rumor is going around among the neighboring peoples that you and the Jewish people intend to revolt, and that this is why you're building the wall. He also says you plan to make yourself king, and that you have arranged for some prophets to proclaim in Jerusalem that you are king of Judah. His majesty is certain to hear about this, so I suggest that you and I meet to talk the solution over. <laughs> the situation. Or the situation. I sent a reply to him. Nothing of what you are saying is true. You've made up all of this for yourself, by yourself. So, I mean, think about it. If the guy really was serious about talking and that's all he wanted to do, he knew where they were. He could have come to Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Well, that wasn't what he wanted to do, of course. Well, and Nehemiah <laughs> knew the king. Yeah. yeah. So Nehemiah knew that this was only an attempt to try to stop the work and to destroy him. Mm-hmm. He flatly denied all the charges. His enemies even managed to get someone who lived inside Jerusalem to call Nehemiah to his side and try to hide in the temple for fear that he might be killed. You know, maybe they're going to come in here and they're going to destroy you and they're going to da-da-da. Now, Nehemiah was not a Levite. What were the rules about who could be in the temple? Only the... Only the Levites, only the priests were supposed to occupy buildings rooms inside the temple. So once again, Nehemiah refused. So we're going to ask a question. How did a cupbearer and a wine taster for the emperor develop the skills and faith he needed to carry out this work? I think he was listening. He was listening, and remember, he prayed about this and fasted four months. Before mm-hmm. he even came, that's Before right. he even got permission. Yeah. At the end of this world's history, when Satan comes pretending to be Christ... He will give away his true identity by claiming that he has changed the day of worship from Sabbath to Sunday. Will he also make other false claims? Probably. Almost certainly. What else is he going to do we know for sure? Perform miracles of healing. Oh, yeah. Do we know the Bible well enough so that we will not be deceived by his false claims? How can we know clearly what God's will is for us. 
Don't we have clear evidence that our overall task is to finish carrying the gospel to the world? I can remember a lesson we had quite a long time ago that said, you may go through all kinds of terrible problems and you may get opposition from this side and the other side. Remember, things may terrible things may stop you right now, but you know that the final goal is guaranteed out there in the future. So there's no question about where you're going at the end, right? Well, what kind of opposition, opposition are we facing today? From what? Ellen G. White, Prophets and Kings. The opposition and discouragement that the builders in Nehemiah's day met from open enemies and pretended friends is typical of the experience that those today will have who work for God. Christians are tried not only by the anger, contempt, and cruelty of enemies, but by the indolence, inconsistency, lukewarmness, and treachery of avowed friends and helpers, so-called friends and helpers. Wow. Do you think that could happen in our day? That's an amazing statement. It's an amazing statement. Kings 6.44. Yeah. Worth looking at. Yeah. Wow. Also on page uh, 658, she says, Satan's assaults have ever been directed against those who sought to advance the work and cause of God. Though often baffled, he has... Uh, he has often renewed his attacks with vi fresh vigor, using means hitherto untried. Can I interrupt for a second? What do you suppose it means when it says using means hitherto untried? Hmm. Something that hasn't been used before. Satan is going to come up with every imaginable thing and d coming from different directions and ideas and attacks that Which we haven't even thought, thought about. about. Yeah, it's... Um, Okay, go ahead. But it is his secret working through those who avow themselves the friends of God's work that the most that is most to be feared. Wow, so what does that mean? False. The worst enemies are the enemies within. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could that happen to our people in our church today? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Open opposition may be fierce and cruel, but it is fraught with far less peril to God's cause than is the secret enmity of those who, with professing to serve God, are at heart the servants of Satan. Can I interrupt again? Yeah. Can you think of how that might happen in our day? How an avowed friend of the church could cause problems? A pastor, a teacher. Uh-huh. A professor would do what? Could say, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's this way. Yes. That's what my friend was facing yeah. in terms of evolution and creationism. I, some of you know about times when pastors have risen up and got a huge following and then all of a sudden it, you discover that they're up to some crazy notion doing crazy stuff. Or maybe there's all of a sudden taken up some offshoot kind of an idea and they're trying to get everybody to follow them like that. Mm -hmm. What are the chances that that's going to increase in the future? I think there's every chance. 100% chance that that's going to increase in the future. Okay, Myra. Uh, these have it in their power to place every advantage in the hands of those who will use their knowledge to hinder the work of God and injure his servants. And we're okay. still talking about people from within. Within, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have to remind so, ourselves of that. So think about this now. Suppose that you are on trial for being a Seventh-day Adventist and you are, you are being tried for keeping the Sabbath. And who would be the most successful person to, to witness against you? Somebody who used to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Maybe knew you as a friend. He said, well, I know this person did da-da-da-da, and they did this and that and the other. As you asked before, if you were convicted of worshiping on the Sabbath, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Yeah. And even wider than that, if you were on trial for being a Christian, yeah. would there be enough evidence to, to, to convict you? Okay, Jim. 
As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message have but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Okay, can I interrupt again? How many of you are going to do that? I Sounds said a like large a, class. A large Fair class. That's, that's not a few here and there. A large class. That means there's a lot of wishy-washy people even in the church today, right? Okay, Jim. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light, and when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren, when Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to sir, stir up the rulers against them. Great Controversy 608. Okay, now I'm going to I'm going to give you a scenario here. Okay, suppose the time comes when it's against the law to worship on the Sabbath. But Adventists are still meeting, some here in someone's house and there in someone else's house or maybe in a secret place somewhere. And someone who has formerly been a part of that group but now turns against them, who's most likely to know about the, the secret quiet places where you would meet? Well, that person that has been with them. Exactly. And you say, well, you don't, he says he's not worshiping on the Sabbath or whatever, whatever he says. If you go out there on such and such a day, or you, I was there, I saw this, I saw that, and they will be, I can tell you, there will be people who will be there in the group pretending to be faithful Sabbath keepers, but they're there as spies. Well, that happened to uh, my uncle who was a pastor in East Germany. Mm -hmm. When the wall mm -hmm. came down, there were people in his congregation that left. That never showed up again that for never, worship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, then he, and he always had knew there were spies mm -hmm. there. Yeah. He was always aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. How do you put Psalms 23 in that? So yeah. you go through the valley of the shadow of death, why would you or fear evil? Yeah. You know, isn't, isn't the infant one perfectly oh, capable yeah. of doing yes. what's necessary? So do we need to uh, sleep with our swords or whatever? Well, but the, the point is, thinking about this is, you don't need to be foolish either. You don't, you need, you don't stand out in the red square and, 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 and conduct a worship service. <laughs> you know, so there's, there's, you know, two parts of that. Go ahead. In Nehemiah's firm devotion to the work of God and his equally firm reliance on God lay the reason of the failure of his enemies to draw him into their power. The soul that is indolent falls an easy prey to temptation. But in the life that has a noble aim and absorbing purpose, evil finds little foothold. The faith of him who is constantly advancing does not weaken. For above, beneath, beyond, he recognizes infinite love, working out all things to accomplish his good purpose. God's true servants work with a determination that will not fail because the throne of grace is their constant dependence. Now, let's just think about this for a moment. There are other groups, church groups and other good groups that, that do various kinds of, of uh, good things. Should we just immediately associate ourselves with those people? I mean, they're doing a good work. Should should we be helping the should we be helping the Salvation Army? Yes, we think so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've I've, so. I've heard it repeated by other. Uh, Ellen White, I, I believe, also stated that there's no yeah. end to the good that can be done as long as no no one cares who gets the credit. Yeah, that's that's part of. She specifically says the Salvation Army is doing a very good work. God bless them, but that's not our job. Well, sometimes there's people being 
claiming to be very, very conservative and just very faithful followers of God, and they're the enemy. Can you think of some examples from the Bible? Yeah, the Pharisees. The think Pharisees. about the Pharisees yeah. and their claims against Jesus. How about Lucifer himself? Yeah, Lucifer himself. We don't have time to read it now, but Daniel 10, verses 12 to 14 and 20 through 21 talks about the supernatural enemies that are in conflict here and, and God and, and himself and Jesus Christ and Gabriel saying, basically saying, Satan, leave, these, leave the emperor alone. Let him make his free choice. You, you're not allowed to, to over, overexert yourself. You know, give, give them a chance. And so it, it's quite an interesting statement. Well, was God using excessive force? No, he was just trying to keep Satan from using excessive force. So how do you think you would have fit into this story spread over, over 70 years? Would you have had the courage to put your life on the line when you thought God was behind the project? Well, I hope so. We are told clearly the most difficult time ever for God's people to face is still in front of us. Are we prepared? You feel that you are just an ordinary person and so forth. And Dennis, I think you have some words that we're going to see we get in before we run out of time. Our Savior did not ignore learning or despise education, yet he chose unlearned fishermen for the work in the, of the gospel because they had not been schooled in the false customs and traditions of the world. They were men of good natural ability and of humble, teachable spirit, men whom he could educate for his great work. In the ordinary walks of life, there is many a man patiently treading the round of daily toil, all unconscious, unconscious that he possesses power that if called into action would raise him uh, to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse and develop these dormant faculties. It was such men whom Jesus connected with himself, and he gave them the advantage of three years of training under his own care. No course of study in the schools of the rabbis or the halls of philosophy could have equaled this in value. The Son of God was the greatest educator the world ever knew. Uh, Ellen White, Review and Herald. Okay, so how do we know whether we're one of those people? The only way we can know is try. The only thing, what we, we need to step out in faith, and we need to say, God, give us direction. It looks like we need to go this way. You be with us, and we'll see. You'll open the doors. Our kind and loving Father, the challenge has been heard. Nehemiah is a great example as to how we should relate to you and the work that needs to be done. Give us the courage to step out even when we're not completely sure that we're going in the right direction because we believe that you will guide us. May that be our experience from today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.